Good morning. Good to see you all. Uh, this is TD, the Titanium Dragon. I am a writer and reviewer from uh, Film Fiction, uh, and uh, I decided to uh, volunteer my services this morning to do a uh, panel, and uh, and it's now actually working. And it only took us 26 minutes, so hopefully uh, this I can do the presentation rather quickly here. So, uh, good morning. The uh, presentation today is The Universal Engagement Curve, the squiggly line that controls all media. This is a uh, uh, presentation about pacing. So uh, here's that uh, squiggly line. So uh, any of you have any questions? No, 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 no. Um, so what is the Universal Engagement Curve? The universal engagement curve is basically a uh, measure of the intensity of a work, um, and this is uh, this can basically be anything: uh, drama, humor, action, difficulty, decisions, poignancy, whatever. Um, it's not any one particular thing, but it's sort of a way a measure of the sort of intensity is the best word for it, um, because your word, work should always be engaging. Um, most of you probably are familiar with the uh, standard story structure. You've got your hook here at the beginning. Then you've got kind of a, a decline as you get into the setup of your story. There's usually more exposition here. It's more talky. You're, you know, kind of establishing your characters and your setting and all that stuff. Then you have your rising action, your climax, and your resolution. But what's interesting is, is that this sort of pattern of... Uh, Rising, falling, and rising action again is actually seen in all sorts of media. Um, so if you were to play a video game like Rainbow Six Siege, you would actually see a very similar thing. You have your team set up at the beginning while you're all uh, fighting over what what character you want to play as. And then there's that moment at the beginning while you're all setting up and waiting for the opponents. And then you've got your nice close proximity firefights. And uh, then, you know, maybe you're the last man standing. Or someone planted the bomb, and you know it's a desperate moment, and then you win, or you complain about how the other team was hacking. <laughs> so, um, oh, so I, I see. This is, uh, I guess, one exciting thing about the uh, sort of text feedback here is that we can uh, even ask questions during the uh, main presentation. So. Um, I actually will be getting to your question, Lemma, in uh, just a minute here. So uh, we will be getting there shortly. Um, so uh, why does this curve exist? And you know why isn't why isn't it just exciting as exciting as possible all the time? So well, there's a few reasons for this. Um, one reason is contrast. If you have everything feel equally intense all the time, people actually become acclimated to it. Um, by having differences in what you're doing, and I, as I gesture at my computer here, because none of you can see that, but uh, as you go up, as you go up and down this curve, um, you see a greater contrast, and therefore it makes the highs feel higher. Um, additionally, <laughs> um, it avoids overwhelming the audience. If you have too much intensity for too long, it wears the audience out. Um, a work that constantly throws out plot twists or other intense events will often lose the reader, um, make them not be able to track what's going on, confuse them, and then it'll ultimately make them disengage. And you actually see the same thing in video games. Video games that are super intense all the time will overwhelm people. And it also just avoids making the audience bored. You can, you know, sustain a lower level of intensity for a long time, but it ends up making the experience feel really samey. So, um, yeah, so hopefully some of this will be useful to you guys. So the hook is the very start of this whole whole thing, and it's basically the thing at the start that grabs the audience. Um, that This is a higher intensity point in the story, um, and it starts at the very beginning because you want to grab their attention. You want to get something from them at the very start because it's your first impression and it's often often also your last. Um, 
Then you get into your setup phase. Um, there's a lot of exposition in the setup phase. Uh, this gives the audience a chance to breathe after the initial period of high intensity. This is a period where you often will introduce more characters, work on characterizing them, uh, do world building. And sometimes you'll actually set up the uh, real conflict here. Um, the uh, James Bond movies really love doing this. They have like their super intense beginning and then they, you know, get into the main story later with the initial hook dragging you in, you know, pulling you in long enough to listen to all that exposition and, you know, hear James get uh, snarked out by M and Moneypenny. Um, it also gives the audience a chance to sort of relax and settle into your world. Um, but it's important to remember that this lower intensity isn't the same thing as being boring. You you want to still be engaging here, but it's just not as intense. Um, then you have your rising action, which is where things start getting more intense. You build up towards your climax here. Um, as you work through this section, you're typically replacing plot points that get resolved uh, <laughs> with uh, with new ones to help keep pulling the audience forward. Um, just you want to keep them uh, keep them going through, and uh, yeah, I, I'm sure. I, yeah, the uh, James Bond movies definitely do uh, have uh, lots of climaxes, um, and the climax is just the peak of the intensity of the work as you approach it. Um, this actually is the point where you start resolving those plot points and not replacing them. So during the uh, rising action phase, you're basically constantly replacing your uh, your your plot points with new ones because you're still building the story but as you, when you reach the climax you're actually starting to resolve things on a more permanent basis and so it is at that point that you're not replacing them constantly this helps to make the story feel like it's coming to a conclusion and this is uh the part that um the work really hinges on um so it needs to be good because this is like the the you know the peak moment of intensity so you need to make sure that it actually feels like the peak and then you've got your resolution and denouement. The uh, intensity generally declines in this part as you uh, wrap things up. And this serves as sort of a secondary breather, much like the initial part did down here, the setup. But this is a, and this, you don't want to make your conclusion go on for too long because you've already passed the most exciting part of your story. And so it can make everything feel downhill from there. You'll often feel, see a little um, actually uptick. At the very end, um, this isn't universal, but uh, you will often see that where the very, very end is like a slightly higher note just to leave the audience with something that feels satisfying. Um, so what's interesting, though, about the this is that it's not actually really just one curve. The universal engagement curve is actually fractal. Um, and I use that word because I am a giant nerd, but also because it's um, really what it is. So as you can see, what's actually going on in this rising action section is actually not a straight line, but instead a bunch of little miniature curves. As you reach um, individual climaxes, and then you have little breathers in here, and then you have another climax. Each of these climaxes serves as a hook that pulls you in for the next. <laughs> no math class what wait, wait. You, you 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 came to a lecture about uh, about a curve and you weren't expecting math oh man you know we're just going to be going straight into the uh quadratic equations and all that stuff no 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 i'm not doing any of that but uh it, it it's important to know that this is actually what's really going on because um a constant long-term ramp up is really hard to sustain and make it not overwhelm the audience. By having the intensity rise and fall continuously, you actually create that contrast on a constant basis um, because instead of having just the beginning, the middle, and then the climax, you actually have a bunch of smaller climaxes in the middle as you go through. Um, this is actually... so. All of this sounds good, and someone in the chat was mentioning, okay, but how do we do this? Uh, you know, so this is the typical three-act structure. Um, this is just a sort of image I actually found online, which is cute, um, but it, it kind of shows uh, how this can often work in a three-act thing. You've got 
you know, your exposition at the beginning, you have some inciting incident that like kicks off your story. Um, so this is basically the part where you have your normal life, then things change, you get your first plot point, you have uh, some midpoint here where you go through a struggle, you have more rising action, and then the the last third of the film, you have the climax, and then you have your resolution in here. Um, so this is pretty typical, but as you'll notice, there's actually a problem here. You, you started out in your normal kind of world back here, and this is actually a very normal way for a story to start. Um, but the problem is, is that when you look at this, you'll notice that there's no, there's not that little, you know, that little higher point at the beginning. There's no hook. And this is actually a huge problem because you really want to, uh, you really want to start with a hook, but uh, three act structure and actually, in fact, many stories naturally seem to start in a trowel rather than a, um, than a high point. The uh, hero's journey is another example of this, where you have your um, your hero start out in the um, sort of normal world, and then some special thing happens, and they you know end up in the magical world, or they are off on an adventure, or they get sent to Iraq, or whatever else. Um, this is actually why a lot of works end up being rather uh, boring at the beginning of them. Uh, and this is universal across media. It's something everyone struggles with. A lot of games have tutorial sections at the beginning. And a lot of times the tutorial sections are actually really boring. They'll like stick you out in some training area or something. Um, you see the same thing and just all sorts of media. So there's, what's the solution to this? So there's a lot of solutions. Um, the first is the James Bond solution, which I mentioned earlier, which is the action prologue. And uh, I don't, I don't know if all of you have seen James Bond films, but they always start out with a sequence where James Bond does something really awesome, and uh, but it's often only tangentially related to the main plot in ways that are frequently only discovered later. Um, this sequence stands on its own, and it doesn't require a lot of background knowledge. We just see someone being awesome, and you can just kind of figure out from the context what's going on. It doesn't require a lot of backstory. And then this is then followed up with the exposition section as James Bond returns and his boss gives him his assignment and you start seeing the real story. Um, and a lot of a lot of stories do this. Um, the Wheel of Time, if any of you have read that, um, starts with the uh, madness of Luz Theron Telemann, who's uh, basically the previous version of the main character when his previous incarnation. Yep, uh, the day... <laughs> I see everyone is making James Bond jokes now. Yes. Um, the, uh, the Day of the Dead sequence from Spectre would be an example. Um, and, but, you know, this is seen in all sorts of media. You, you have uh, Cars, the Disney movie, started with a race that ended in a three-way tie. Um, you had Jurassic Park that starts with the worker being eaten with a, by a velociraptor and, you know, violating all of the OSHA rules. You know, Final Fantasy VII starts with avalanche blowing up the reactor this is seen in all sorts of media from books to movies to video games um and this is really really useful in some ways it's immediate it's easy to understand and it's a visceral action that can pull the reader into the story and also casually in establish important world building elements like 007 is a secret agent there's magic you know in the world uh dinosaurs are in this park all that stuff can be established in this exciting, you know, section that just just immediately just goes off. Um, it can also be used to drop some information and characterization of the uh, main characters. Um, for example, Cars kind of shows off the main character's arrogance, um, but this can also be difficult to interweave correctly. A lot of the time, there's going to be very basic level of characterization here. You know, James Bond, we get to see him. You know. Um, be competent and, you know, do his bond one-liner, be, uh, you know, cold and, uh, you know, being his, you know, professional self, but also seeing, you know, that he, you know, has to kill people. Um, not the problem with these things is that not all stories lend themselves to this sort of action segment. And in stories with more sparse action, this can also create uh, false expectations and disappointment. So while these sorts of action prologues can be really useful, not every story can um, pull it off. Another classic uh, 
solution is uh, to start in the thick of the story, um, which is in nerd terms called in BDS res. Um, and I may or may not have pronounced that correctly. Uh, but um, if your story, if the start of your story isn't grabbing, why put it first? The basic theory behind it is, is that you start out later in the plot when it's more intense, skipping the initial phase of exposition entirely, and then fill it in later. You're basically taking this section from the middle of your story and then sticking it right at the beginning so as to hopefully pull your audience in. There's actually a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, I pulled this off of uh, this. Actually, this image was from TV Tropes over here, but it shows different ways of doing this. You can see, um, you, you know, in a conventional story, you start with the beginning, you go to the middle, and then you go to the end. But um, an in media rest story might intersperse um, the middle of the story with the beginning of the story, which is something that Deadpool does. Or uh, it might start out with something and then go through the story, the rest of the story in linear order. Um, no. So um, these stories in media rest usually... Um, <laughs> oh, trick question. I, I don't think I'm allowed to answer that question on the stream. I think these are supposed to be PG. So, um, but this is a th this is a pretty standard trope. Um, oh, what, what's the one without any beginning? That's that's actually um, these are all forms of in media res. Um, but um, basically. A lot of times these are nonlinear, but they don't always do so. Um, so, for instance, uh, Final Fantasy VI, I don't know if any of you have played this, but this was a classic game in the 90s, actually starts with the main character being brainwashed and attacking a town in a suit of power armor. And we actually never see what led up to this. We, we don't actually know, but we, you know, via later exposition, we sort of find out. Um, because the start the story starts there because we don't we never really see with our backstory because that's just not the way the game works. Um, but you know this is this is common. Um, you know you, we saw this in Magical Mystery Cure for My Little Pony where Twilight's cutie marks are already messed up or Twilight's friend's cutie marks are already messed up and then we flash back. You know Deadpool starts with Deadpool getting his revenge during that. You know sequence at the start that action sequence at the start um and then fight club actually starts at the very end of the movie um with a gun in the protagonist's mouth moments before the climax of the film and the entire rest of the film is uh devoted to getting back to that moment so um immediate rest is a really useful um useful trick um because by starting at a later point in the story you make the audience know that you're really going to do some exciting stuff. And it can also build questions in people's minds about, um, whoops, sorry about that, about what's going to, going to happen. And you can sometimes actually skip boring stuff. <laughs> oh, Memento is actually going to be in just a couple slides. So, uh, but yeah, you can set up and subvert expectations by, uh, by doing this um, because you have told the audience what's going to happen, but they don't necessarily know why um, telling the audience out of telling the audience, the story out of order can confuse them though. Um, and it isn't necessarily uh, always the best option. Um, actually seeing as we brought up an anachronistic storytelling, and this is an interactive presentation, we have an audience here who can talk to me, I can just skip right to that slide. So um, not all stories actually follow the universal engagement curve, and an anachronistic story is actually, uh, storytelling is one of the means of doing that. Um, so you can just basically not tell your story in order, and then sort of trickle, being tricky, and uh, so even though, say, the climax is actually at the middle of the work, you can still put it at the end because you, you know, can tell things out of order and just go up and ramp up the excitement in that way. Um, the problem with this is, is that these movies can also be incredibly confusing. I don't know if you've read, if you guys have ever seen the movie Looper, but a lot of mo people have a lot of trouble following that film. Uh, Memento actually 
follows a very set structure where it alternates between the beginning and the end of the timeline back and forth to uh, try and keep the audience um, <laughs> keep the audience from being too confused. But uh, it, the more nonlinear your storytelling gets, the harder it can be to pull it off. One of the other things about it is, is that you often have to use the time, uh, your time switching and very cleverly and hide things because if you don't, you can kind of give away your own plot. So by making the audience constantly confused about what's going on is kind of a tactic that it uses because you're not necessarily aware of what just came, came before or after um, because that way you're hiding plot points that haven't been seen yet, but it's it's very difficult to do. Um, because we started late, I'm going to actually try and get through this quickly so we still have time for questions. Um, there's also the just sort of intrigue them solution to pulling people into your story with hooks. Um, this is just basically having an opening line or opening that raises a question in uh, the minds of the audience. Like, for instance, it was the day my grandmother exploded. Uh, it was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Um, these sorts of things can grab people. Um, you know, uh, the opening of uh, the opening of <laughs> American Gods, which now that I'm uh, thinking about it, I probably shouldn't have used, but uh, talks about how Shadow is a uh, man who was uh, in prison for three years. Um, and so he kept himself in shape, taught himself coin tricks, and thought a lot about how much he loved his wife. And uh, so this, this serves as a means of basically pulling the audience in. Um, the start of American Gods actually starts out with a lot of kind of exposition, world building, fill in the stuff. Um, and the way, one of the ways it tricks people into reading it okay i say should say tricks but this is a it's actually a really good book um but it you know tries to intrigue you you know what sort of person teaches themselves coin tricks in prison why is this something that's important to them um you know being incongruent or wrong can intrigue people uh, why would the clocks be striking 13 um and the answer is that's actually the introduction of 1984 because 1984 is a world that is off you know Yeah, yeah. Shorter stories, you have to immediately grab the audience. Though shorter stories do actually have one major advantage over most other kinds of stories, and that the shorter they are, the uh, the easier it is to uh, uh, pull the audience all the way through. If you only have to read a thousand words, it's easier to convince the audience to stick with you than if they have to write uh, to read a hundred thousand. But uh, yeah, it's really it's really helpful to grab the audience at the start. Um, so there's a few other things that I wanted to go over really quickly before I, uh, I take questions, but there's a few other tricks that people use. Um, and one of the other ones is ending with the climax. This is on the actual exact opposite end of the story, but this is where you cut off the conclusion entirely and you just end your story at the peak. Um, this actually has the advantage that it ends your story on the single highest point, which emphasizes the power and importance of that. And it helps it stick with the reader. Um, this is typically used in stories that have some sort of reveal at the end of the story, um, which recontextualizes the rest of the story. So there's no need for a proper conclusion. Um, and it can also be used to imply some conclusion without right stating it, particularly a bad ending that you don't want to show on screen. But uh, this is a dangerous, um, a dangerous sort of proposition because um, you know, your, it, your story doesn't have a conclusion, so it can make it feel like it lacks resolution. This is why it's a lot of time used for plot twists is because the rest of the story, by being recontextualized, in a sense, in, a sense, in essence, I'm sorry, I can't talk this morning, uh, makes the conclusion being your mind going through and figuring out what was done. So um, I'm not sure... We have 10 minutes left, so I think maybe it would, it's time to just go straight to the questions at the end. Um, I know some of you have questions, so uh, feel free to shoot them at me.
Yeah, leaving things uncertain can definitely uh, work out pretty well. Um, it's one of those. Uh, it's one of those things that can work really well, or can also, you know, just end up disappointing the audience. You know, the the ending of the Sopranos is definitely a controversial ending for the way it just sort of ends abruptly. And yes, uh, Nora, we will. I actually have already uploaded it, and I will link you guys to it once the presentation is over, um, so you guys can go through it. I skipped a few slides at the end, which were just basically a bunch of uh, slides about con pacing mistakes. All right, so, uh, okay, a few questions here. Um, so Catalyst's Cradle asked, would the universal engagement curve apply to nonfiction writing? And the answer to that is yes, it actually does. It applies to literally everything. Um, it's often difficult to um, make it apply to nonfiction writing because in real life, a lot of real life situations don't actually um, follow the universal engagement curve at all. I mean, like, think about a natural disaster, for instance. Um, in real life, you have your natural disaster, and things go horribly, and then uh, things start gradually getting better after the disasters. You start cleaning stuff up. So, you know, that's that's completely wrong. You've got your climax at the start, and you and then you've got you know declining action all throughout it. So, it's um, it's difficult to tell a real a real life story in this way, but sometimes you can use various tricks. Um, but for things like uh, articles and stuff, they uh, it's actually often the case that you will do that. Now, uh, a lot of journalism doesn't do it that way. They use something known as the inverted pyramid, um, where they uh, basically start out with the, the most important and exciting bits. And then as it goes on, um, the article kind of peters out. And they do that basically to um, to to try and communicate the most important idea via the headline and the first couple of paragraphs of the story. Cause they figure that a lot of people are only going to read that far. And so they want to get the most important information into the people's minds, but it's not an ideal way of writing. And if you look at a lot of uh, longer form uh, journalism articles, they actually will tend to um, try to abide more by the uh, universal engagement curve with, you know, an exciting bit at the start that you know tries to introduce you to this thing and then it like starts working on building a basis and then as you go through it sort of builds on what's going on um all right so what's another question uh what would the engagement curve look like for something like deus ex where the intro starts off jumping into exposition about the major background plot points. I haven't played Deus Ex. I, I know, I'm terrible. Um, I actually do own the game, but I've never actually played it, so I'm not quite certain. Um, but um, it, it, a lot of things will start out with like sort of an exposition dump at the very start. Like Star Wars, for instance, has the uh, scrolling screen of uh, basically you know, exposition at the start where it's, you know, it, it has the sort of background of like, you know, what's going on. Um, and the reason that they make that work is that you're, well, first off, you're a captive audience and you're, you already paid to get to watch the movie. So uh, having a minute of exposition isn't the end of the world. But secondly, they then jump into the exciting bit immediately thereafter. So that is sort of showing this sort of curve at the start because, you know, it's, it starts out a little bit lower and then it reaches, you know, that, that first peak, you know, really quickly. Um, uh, let's see. Could you, okay. Sp Spike asked, uh, speak, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Could you go into an ending with uh, plane resolution over, well, let's see here. Hmm. I'm not quite sure if I understand what you're asking, Spike. Uh, speak. Um, are you asking me to just go into more detail about that, about the uh, conclusion? Um, so the Mountaineer asked, uh, "Would it, the curve for an entire series do that?" Yes, actually, I uh, one of the skipped slides I. Um, 
mentions this, but basically, yeah, um, uh, long episodic series will often actually do exactly that. Um, you try and have your, you know, initial episode that's like, you know, usually more intense. And actually, um, My Little Pony actually stuck to this pretty, pretty consistently. They would have a sort of intense episode at the start, you know, like the two parters. And then as the season went on, um, they, the rest of the episodes would be kind of all over the place. And then there would be a sort of middle episode that would also be kind of a high point. And then there would be some more episodes and then they would have the ending which would usually also be um a high point so they were kind of trying to do um do a season long curve where it was up and down and up um but um it's actually very hard to do that with longer works because the longer the work is the um more difficult it is to actually sustain rising action for a long time um that's why uh that's one of the reasons why um, mixing things up um, with different kinds of episodes can be helpful is because you can make episodes feel intense in different sorts of ways. Um, like some of them can be more dramatic while some of them can be more funny. Um, and that way you can still get a sense of, um, of, you know, intensity, but not take away from the dramatic intensity. So um, a lot of the time in My Little Pony, the start, uh, middle and end the sort of main plot was more serious than a lot of the other episodes which were often more comedic okay um yeah i'll, I'll just take i'll just uh i'll just finish um answering speak's question and then i'll let the next person start um so speak asked um about the difference between uh, conclusion sort of falling off versus falling off and then going upwards again at the very end. Um, so the difference there is mostly, um, so for example, the Avengers movies would be one example of this. Um, you've got, you know, you have your climax of the movie and then you have your conclusion. Conclusion. A lot of the Marvel verse movies will have this conclusion and then the end will kind of start wrapping things up and the audience will, you know, see the characters talking to each other or, you know, decompressing after the plot's over, discussing what happened. And then there's like some sort of stinger or post-credit sequence that implies that something bigger is coming. So, for instance, uh, you know, the, um, what's his name? Uh, the, the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. shows up and, you know, inducts someone into the Avengers or you see Thanos at the end who is apparently plotting something big. And that's sort of an example of a final uptick as, um, as something that mm, can uh, be just, you know, a final thing. Um, this also works in comedic movies. A lot of times a comedic movie will also end with a punchline. Like Clue um, would be an example of that where um, you have uh, the, uh, you know, each of the endings has the climax where the the bad guy is arrested or shot and then you have your you know conclusion and it ends with a final final joke you know all right i, I think we have like one like one minute left so oh no we're i think we're out of time here but if you have one last question i can answer it You're welcome. I'm glad. Uh, I, ho I hope this was useful to you all. Um, and I think uh, Zephyr is itching for the next panel to start. So I believe we will be ending things here. But thank you all for, uh, for listening. And I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. I'm sorry we had technical issues and started almost a half hour late. But okie dokie. Thank you very much.